If you enjoy the content on this channel, please like and subscribe. Outlaw King is a 2018 historical action drama film about the 14th century Scottish King Robert the Bruce during the Scottish Wars of Independence. The film largely takes place during the three-year period from 1304 when Bruce decides to rebel against the rule of Edward I over Scotland, up to the 1307 Battle of Loudon Hill. Outlaw King was co-written, produced and directed by David Mackenzie. The film starred an ensemble cast led by Chris Pine as Robert the Bruce alongside Erin Taylor Johnson, Florence Pugh, Billy Howe, Sam Spruill, Tony Curran, Callan Mulvey, James Cosmo and Stephen Delan. It premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival on September 6, 2018 and digitally released on November 9, 2018 by Netflix. The film received mixed reviews from critics with praise for its production, design, sets, performances and choreography but criticism for its historical inaccuracies and cliches. The film had its premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival. The premiere ran time of 137 minutes and its pacing were criticised by early reviews and Mackenzie subsequently cut nearly 20 minutes from the film. Cut materials include a battle scene, a major confrontation backdrop by a waterfall and an 8 minute chase sequence and a scene in which Pine's character meets William Wallace in the woods. Now let's discuss the historical authenticity of the film. The film implies Robert I, Robert the Bruce here, began his rebellion almost immediately after the execution of William Wallace, implying that he had intended to avenge Wallace. He began his rebellion though a full year later after Wallace's death. During the intermediate period, Edward I became suspicious of Robert I and ordered him to stay at Kildrummy Castle. The film also shows Robert I marrying Elizabeth de Burgh after surrendering to Edward I. Bruce's second marriage actually occurred years before in 1302. The film's depiction of Edward II's role in the Battle of Loudoun Hill is heavily flawed. It is unlikely that he was present at the battle in any capacity. Moreover, it is certain that he would have not challenged Bruce to a single combat. Even if he had been present and challenged Bruce to personal combat, a hostage as valuable as Edward II would have not been allowed to flee, as is shown in the film. In addition to Edward II's presence, the depiction of the Battle of Loudoun Hill incorporates several other elements from a latter and more decisive battle of Bannercock Burn such as the death of Robert de Clifford. The titled character in Outlaw King is that of the enigmatic and well-behaved man of the people who desires to restore Scotland to its inhabitants. However, historian Fiona Watson notes that the real Robert I was most likely a cold, canny and driven by his own personal ambition. The colour yellow is mostly absent from the clothing of the fighting men. In contrast, yellow dye was not only the most common dye in Scotland during the period, it was highly favoured by fighters with the means to afford it. Historian Fergus Cannon notes that while many historical writers comment on its prevalence, it remains absent from appearance in popular culture related to Scottish history. The film also depicts the character of Edward II as a cruel and oppressive person who is eager to succeed his father, despite any historical evidence of Edward II having displayed such traits. On the contrary, Edward II was reluctant to assume the mantle of kingship and was known to be generous with his servants. The film also portrays Edward I dying before the Battle of Loudoun Hill, which in actuality he died several months later. Furthermore, the film implies that Edward I was buried where he died, when in fact he was interred at Westminster Abbey in London. In the film, when Robert I tells his brothers about his plan to start a rebellion, the artichokes can be seen on the table. However, artichokes were not introduced to the British Isles until the 16th century. Some interesting trivia notes. The first nine minutes of the film is one continuous choreographed tracking shot, beginning with the close-up on the candle flame to the oaths of fealty to the duel and finishing with the firing of the trebuchet on the castle. The Prince of Wales is depicted in this movie. He was the first ever to hold this title. His father, Edward I, had conquered Wales and had a policy that no one born outside of the principality could rule. Edward therefore transported his heavily pregnant wife to Carinofren Castle, which he'd built to keep the Welsh in check, so that her son Edward was born in Wales. King Edward then promptly declared his son Prince of Wales, thereby stealing the crown of Wales and sealing the Principality's subjugation to the English crown. The heir of the UK crown holds that title to this day. Edward II was actually the youngest of Edward I's four sons, all of whom died by the time Edward I's reign came to an end. Edward I also had several nicknames, the two most popular being Longshanks due to his considerable height and the Hammer of the Scots for his unrelenting fight against the Scottish. No reference is made to Edward, Prince of Wales, later Edward II's notorious homosexuality, something heavily alluded to in Braveheart in 1995. Many of historians dispute this claim though, since the real Edward fathered at least five children. At the beginning sequence during the Siege of Stirling, the Scottish barons say that the castle did offer to surrender, but King Edward refused in order to test his new troubadour. The troubadour did exist, it was named Warwolf or Loup de Guerre. As mentioned in the film, it took at least three months to build. 
When not assembled, the pieces would fill 30 carts, and the real King Edward did refuse to accept the first surrender in order to test it. The close-up shot of a spider web before the Battle of Loudoun is significant because it alludes to the famous legend regarding Bruce's retreat to Ireland. The legend states that Bruce was indecisive about returning to Scotland to rally the armies and fight. While watching a spider attempt to swing across a doorway in its attempt to begin a web, Bruce decided if the spider could complete the swing, he would return to Scotland and fight. The spider was successful, and so was the King of Scots. In the film, Sir James Douglas captures his old family castle, called Castle Douglas, by killing the English garrison on Palm Sunday. These events did occur, and in fact Douglas had to capture his castle further two more times before he raised it to the ground. Robert's child with Elizabeth was a son named David, who went on to rule Scotland for 40 years after his father's reign. When David died, he left no heir, so the throne of Scotland passed on to the son of Robert's daughter, Marjorie, and her husband, Walter, High Steward of Scotland. Robert II, the first monarch of the House of Stuart, would eventually also inherit the throne of England. The descendants of Bruce via the Stuarts, diluted by blood of the German cousins, still hold the throne of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to this day. Now, I found this film to be fascinating. I'm a huge fan of history, particularly that of medieval history. And obviously having watched Braveheart years ago and being frankly disgusted by how historically inaccurate the film is, I was interested to see how Outlaw King would cover this sort of similar period in history. Firstly, the casting of Chris Pine here as playing the Scottish hero Robert the Bruce was an interesting one. He delivers a compelling performance as Robert the Bruce, never really overacting and almost sort of downplays his role. Of course, the portrayal here of Robert the Bruce as this absolute hero who was just trying to be kind and save Scotland is rather well far-fetched. And Pine maybe for me wouldn't have been the exact actor I would have cast in this role, but he does a more than adequate job. I did however like the casting of Eric Taylor Johnson and Florence Pugh as they contribute very solid performances. As does Stephen Delane as King Edward I, but unfortunately an actor who I usually like, Billy Howe, really does overplay his role here as Edward Prince of Wales. The film boasts an impressive production values, especially in terms of cinematography and costume design. The battle scenes are intense and very well choreographed, providing a visceral and realistic portrayal of medieval warfare. Look, while the film is very entertaining and gets many aspects of the medieval time quite right, unfortunately it does take a lot of creative liberties for dramatic effect. It definitely does strive for more historical accuracy compared to films such as, like, say, Braveheart, but still there are too many discrepancies for my liking. And sometimes I just don't understand why Hollywood can't portray the real history as it is, as the real story is just so fascinating. I found the film had pacing issues, and I preferred the sort of slower tone at the start of the film, as I found the end of the film a little bit too rushed and sort of getting to the big battle as quickly as it could. Look, whilst the acting is strong enough, for me it is really the production values that make this film stand out, and its attention to detail on certain aspects of the historical time it covers. So while Outlook King may be a visually striking film with some solid good performances, it is certainly not one of those films that will reach the historical acclaim of other films released covering this sort of genre. It does however offer an engaging portrayal of a crucial chapter in Scottish history, and if you do enjoy historical dramas with epic battles and political intrigue, then Outlaw King definitely will keep you entertained. It's a very well made movie, but unfortunately for me, it's one that could have been done even a little bit better had they been a bit more accurate and a bit more realistic in the portrayal of the very complicated Robert the Bruce. In saying all of that though, the film did keep me entertained and therefore Outlaw King gets an 8 out of 10.